Thank you. All right, we'll call our uh, 630 uh, work session to order and uh, I'd like to welcome the clerk's department uh, for our uh, monthly department presentation. So excited to have all three of you here and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Um, first, the statutory duties include ele for, elect for the clerk's office include administration, planning and overseeing all the operations pertaining to federal, state, and local elections. Maintain office city records, including ordinances, resolutions, contracts, agreements, agendas, minutes, and more. Preparing agenda packets and minutes for commission, as well as all of our commission committee meetings that we have. FOIA coordinator for all of the city departments and notary public, both Jessica and myself. First, we want to talk about elections. Ordering materials for all elections is now done by the clerk's office. Um, the count, county used to order them, but now they are leaving that up to our responsibility. We order ballots, which is no easy task. You, we want to be fiscally responsible, but also never run out. The current cost of ballots is 40 cents per ballot at this time. Elections, um, we have to order all the supplies for absentee ballots, absentee postcard applications that we mail prior to the ballots. Uh, testing of the election equipment includes test, creating the test deck first with our ballots once we receive them, marking the sample ballots, and then we test the ballots on the ICC, which is our fast speed scanner for the absentee ballots. We mark the ballots and then test them on the tabulators that are help, done, used in all the precincts, as well as test the modem that tr transports all of that data to the county. We also then test our ICX, we have a lot of acronyms, which is our voter assist ter terminal. And so we have to make sure that also reads the ballot and they're able to use that at each precinct as well. And then finally is a public accuracy test. We do a internal one and then we do a public accuracy test, which is conducted with the election commission. And that's currently Daryl Schmozell and Dan DeVries, as well as the clerk's office. Now related to elections, I'm gonna let Jessica take over. So elections, we issue ballots to our absentee voters. Um, in order to do that, we must verify signatures on the applications and ballot envelopes for ballots issued and returned. Um, our AV application mailings begin two months before each election. Our mass mailing of ballots uh, begin five to six weeks before each election. We post sample ballots of each ballot style on the city's election webpage. We would determine the number of voters per precinct and AV County Board for each election. And then we administer training classes to workers. Multiple training classes are taught by us. Over 60 to 80 people are hired for each election day. No matter if an election is large or small, uh, the same t list of tasks must be conducted and the process starts three months prior to every election. We have created a total of five manuals for our election workers. We collaborate with the City of Lansing, City of Grand Rapids, and City of Wyoming and created our manuals specific to Walker. Um, those include our absentee voter counting boards for the ICC equipment manual, the AV counting board uh, chairperson manual, precinct chairperson manual, precinct equipment manual, and our electronic poll book computer manual. Uh, these manuals were again created by Walker and are now shared statewide. In regards to schools, Sarah um, does voter awareness presentations, voter registration, and precinct worker drives, um, which Jill and Sarah will be doing at Kenwa Hills High School next Tuesday, September 24th, uh, for National Voter Registration Day. Okay, if we go to the next slide. Uh, I gave you guys some graphs. Uh, this shows an increase in our absentee voters from 2010 to today. In 2010, we had 944 uh, voters on our permanent absentee voter list. In 2013, we increased that to 1,925. As of August, we had 4,132 on the permanent AV list, which made up 20%, 24% 
of our registered voters. Um, as of today, we have 4,148 voters. Um, that number is only expected to increase due to Proposal 3. Uh, proposal 3 gave us the no reason absentee voter. In May of this year, in preparation for the 2020 elections, we mailed out 13,054 no reason AV request forms to voters. Since then, we have received 1,134 back. Um, 1,076 were by mail. 58 by email, because on those applications, we created an election email dedicated just to um, election questions or inquiries. So the voter can actually send the request uh, stating that they want to be put on the permanent AV list, and we can add them now. Uh, we anticipate an increase in expense for cost of postage. Uh, with more people possibly voting absentee, that means more absentee ballots going out as well as applications. Um, NCOA, our national change of address mailings are done every other year and that's something Sarah will go over in the next slide. And then one more slide. Okay, so this is Walker's registered voters. I kind of wanted to do a breakdown, so in the bottom slide it shows 2010 all the way to 2018, showing both even and odd years for November elections. Um, and then I did a breakdown for 2010 versus 2018. This slide is to show a comparison of registered voters and voter turnouts for the November election, showing increases of number of voters registered, ballots cast, and absentee ballots issued. As you can see on the bottom lower graph, it shows a much lower turnout of voters on odd years compared to our November even years when we have a state and federal election. And then this slide is to show a comparison of absentee voters to precinct voters since 2010. Um, odd years, permanent AVs are the majority voters and then it switches where even years, the precincts are the majority voter due to um, voter awareness, which draws people into precincts. We don't know how this will change uh, with no reason AVs coming on to play. So. Okay, and then I'm gonna let Sarah. Election audits. <clears throat> In 2018, the state of Michigan decided to mandate election audits. And the reason behind it is actually quite interesting, um, being on the Bureau of Election Advisory Committees that I'm on. Um, they have find, found that there's lots of missing holes different with different um, townships and cities reporting. And they wanted to find out like where, where are the weak links for learning and educating and training the clerks. Um, so it's helped the Bureau of Elections find and focus areas and improvement. And so now they've really came to um, full circle to coming out and to actually doing a lot more hands-on trainings with clerks um, because there's a lot of turnover and there's a lot of them that they just learn when they when they come in <clears throat> so this process takes multiple days to prepare for um, we actually from the day one we start an election we start a folder and we have to keep all of these required documents in it and then after the election um, we're told what precincts will be audited and then they come and it takes about a day to day and a half for them to complete an audit. Um, they'll do um, maybe one precinct, maybe two precincts, or but also the absentee counting board, which is a huge process all in itself. Um, so that's definitely something that has been a big difference from years gone by. Also with, as Jessica mentioned earlier, with every other year, I started this way back, um, years ago, um, but USPS has, it's called the National Change of Address. And so we, Walker, do this every other year, and we mail out all of our QVF, which is the qualified data file, to KCI, that's our Kent communications that we use for mailing. They do a, they take it and basically do a database cleanup, and they find out, they then send us back three reports. One that says that somebody's moved out of the state or completely out of Michigan, one that they've moved within Walker, but another local address in Walker, and then one that they moved to another jurisdiction in Michigan. So then we send them letters, which we have to, we're mandated to do all of this through the state, 
um, to confirm that they've moved to that address. And by doing that, we've substantially cleaned up our database from um, many, many years ago. And we, by doing this every two years, we keep our database as clean as possible, which really does help us to have a very smooth election day. Upcoming elections. As you all know, we have a November 5th Granville Schools proposal, so Ward 3, Precinct 7, 8, and 9, three precincts. Um, actually, it's going to be a good thing, though, for us. Um, we, as you know, um, purchased the adjudication software, so um, they will be coming tomorrow to install it, but then we'll have a training class in October. Um, so we'll be bringing all of our absentee uh, accounting board members in for that training, and it'll be a good trial run before the busy year ahead. And then March is the presidential primary. May would be a possible school election. August, state primary election. And November, the general election. And back to you. OK. As you know, the clerk's office issues business licenses in our departments. We have been working with community development and assessing to get accurate data. Community development gives us a monthly closed permits list. And then the assessing department, they do a canvassing and create a list for us. We then extract our business licenses, merge them, and delete the duplicates. Out of all of that process, we have actually um, done 76 new business licenses issued since January 1st of 20, uh, 2019, which were never licensed or were new businesses that flew under the radar. We created a step-by-step -step manual of the uh, complete licensing process for all licenses we issue. Uh, 92 new businesses have been licensed as of today, um, 13 of which are home occupations and 79 are new businesses. Uh, this slide shows new businesses licensed over the years. As the clerk's department started to license businesses, we were fit finding more and more businesses through the years. Um, there was a decline in 2013 that can be attributed to less businesses closing or being terminated, um, the economy and the data provided. Uh, we currently have 76 new businesses licensed, no, sorry, 92. Uh, we have been able to improve our thoroughness by working with community development and the assessing department. Uh, this slide shows a breakdown of all licenses we actually issue in the clerk's department. Um, I'm not going to read all of the numbers, but we do snowplow, waste hauler, uh, self-service station, solicitor, secondhand goods, precious metals, and then business licenses. And in regards to business licenses, I broke it down to actual businesses versus home occupations. Today alone, we issued eight new business licenses. Five were home occupations, and three were actual businesses. Um, and I'm going to let Jill talk about passports. I think all of you know that we um, accept passport applications in the clerk's office. Um, someone came in today and they said to me, this is great, it's a one-stop shop. I can get my passport photo, I can get my passport processed, you guys mail it for me, this is great. Um, also, we don't require appointments, they can just come in during any time that our office is open. It's easy, they, too easy for parking. Um, we try to keep it as simple for them as possible. Um, from this chart, you can see that over the past six years, we've seen a steady increase in the number of passports that we've um, issued, that we've accepted the applications for. This chart does not show how many passports renewals we process, um, since they don't have a processing fee. However, we take their picture, we check over their form, and we mail it for them, and it's just a great customer service to get residents into the building and us to interact with them. Um, as the number of passports increases, so does our revenue. There's a $35 pa uh, passport acceptance fee that's set by the U.S. Department of State, and we charge $10 for the photo. So you can see in fiscal year 2018-19, we took in over $10,000 in revenue of photos, over $30,000 in passport execution fees, so our total revenue that we brought in from passports was 40, over $40,000. Um, it's growing rapidly due to word of mouth, social media, website awareness in the community. 
Um, as a comparison, we have about just over $2,000 in expenses for the 2018-19 year. Um, it was actually that $2,000 is actually high compared to what's typical for expenses. Um, we purchased a new camera, a new backlight. Um, we needed to have clearer photos and a true white background, which is required by the U.S. Department of State. So we invested in those things in order to provide those, those better photos. The typical expenses for the year are about $500 for passports. So you can see this is a real win-win situation. There's money coming in, there's a low cost, and it's a service that's appreciated by the community, both residents and non-residents. Each year with the passports, we also are required every two years to go through a passport audit. We received a certificate of excellence in 2015 and 2019. An audit takes about one to one and a half hours. An agent from the Bureau of Consular Affairs comes into the building and performs the audit. They inspect our applications, our security lockbox, um, our transmittals that we've issued, labels, addresses, um, our make sure that our PAR, which is our passport agent reference guide, make sure that that's complete and check our photo ID guides. They also answer several, ask us several questions and give us several scenarios of someone coming in and the type of passport and the process that we would need to go through and the procedures and steps in order to um, process that passport correctly. Um, in addition to the regular office hours, the clerk's office offers appointments for evenings and weekends in case we need to accommodate schedules for people. Okay, iCompass, where it all happens. So iCompass is definitely our portal um, for internal and external. It's an online portal that organizes, manages all of our city web, city information. It also allows residents to access this information as well. As you can see, the list, I don't have to probably read them all for you, but everything the city does is on our portal. Um, it's our lifeline between us and the residents and the community. In iCompass, we also have our records management system, or as Frank calls it, our MS. RMS. Um, with that, um, before I came, um, and when I did arrive, there was zero documents on our city computer. There were some square little floppy drives that had a few documents on them, but that's about it. If you know what those are, right, Elena? <laughs> um, but since then, I busy. I actually started working on scanning in resolutions um, before I even was officially here. And since then, uh, we have everything scanned in, archived, and. In 2015, when we shortly after we brought iCompass on board, we had our wonderful high school interns, such as Nicole, that some of you know, um, and we have over 17,000 documents scanned in and archived. Um, not only scanning them, that's naming them, that's organizing them, it's uploading them, and it's classifying them into a classification coding system in iCompass, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, Jessica and I were just at an iCompass user group conference, and that's what most jurisdictions struggle with, is getting the documents scanned in. And they're all, they always say to everybody, well, Walker did it. But we were very lucky. We were very lucky to have some really great high school students, um, such as Nicole. And she will forever be, we will be indebted to her for all the work she did, um, with, with as well as many others. Um, as going on to the next one, um, iCompass is, um, basically brainstorming right now. They're like, what's next? What's coming? What's the future hold for iCompass? So with the conference that Jessica and I just attended, they are looking at PDFs. PDFs will sometime maybe not be the permanent way to retain things. So they're looking at converting them all to PDFAs for improved permanent retention. Uh, agenda management, different voting types will be available, such as if we need a quorum of three or a quorum of five, if it's a roll call vote, if it's, um, you know, a vote by button versus, or in person versus out loud, or maybe um, whatever different options that there might be out there that you need, they're gonna add those as different things that we can select upon. 
uh, scheduling meetings out 24 months. I think this will be really awesome to have on iCompass. So we'll be able to pre-schedule out the meetings much further. Uh, scratch pad with agenda build to keep track of potential items. Um, that sounds exciting as well. Um, every time there's a topic that comes on that you know might be put on a meeting two months out, we can put that in on the scratch pad. Sharing agendas to others to view before publishing. So internally, if we're working on an agenda, um, we won't have to like publish it and then send it out and then come bring it back to, for critiquing. You know, we can just send it out as a draft internally, review it before we then send out the final published agenda packet. Create, edit, and publish from mobile devices. This is exciting too. They want everybody to be able to use iCompass and the portal um, from any device you have. And so that's a very hot topic. Let's just, let's, let alone inclusion accessibility. As everybody knows, um, that's on the forefront, especially with elections. So they're looking at different techniques like zooming in and out for aging population. Um, with that said, also attending virtually. Uh, veterans, elderly, busy moms with young children. It'll allow them to be able to view the meeting from their house and then also be able to physically attend right through their, the portal um, from their house to here. Um, it's just a way of the future and that's just a few things of that they're brainstorming and you know hope to see come in the near future. So very exciting things. And FOIA coordinators. We all love documents. Um, we actually, it's amazing, I um, can't remember, it was when Kathy retired, um, I took back over the FOIA um, coordinating um, in, the, in the city. And so when we receive these requests, we then send out the request to the different departments that it goes to, and they submit their documents back to the clerk's office, and we archive them and send them back out to the person requesting them. And surprising or not, um, it's 40 to 50 at the minimum per, per year. Um, the steps, like I said, we receive the FOIA, we notify the departments involved, we receive the documents from them, we compile them and send them to the person that has requested them. And that, that paragraph on the bottom is what we put on the bottom so they can directly access our FOIA policy right on our website. Um, they've been very thrilled. I mean, actually, um, we came a long ways with doing everything electronic. We don't charge hardly any FOIAs unless on a rare occasion because everything can be pretty much um, submitted to everybody electronically and I would say we have a three to five day turnaround for almost every single FOIA. The clerk's department is responsible for the following budgets as well. Uh, I oversee the clerk budget, the presidential primary, the May school election budget, which is a separate, they're all separate budgets, and then the August primary and general election budgets. Other items handled by the clerk's department, uh, I oversee the liquor licenses for all different types, the right of, all the right-of-ways, easements, vacates um, that we uh, confirm through the city commission, um, I then record at the Kent County. So we have that for archiving purposes as well. And then bids and postings. We receive bid RFPs from the department. We post the RFPs to the website and the notice in the newspaper. We conduct the bid openings post the bid tabs to the website in replacement from the RFP once they're completed. And then we also archive all the documents, including the envelope for seven years for the retention period. Posting on the city website, we oversee that, as well as clerk's department web pages, including the following list, which you can see, so I won't read them all off for you. And the clerk's the department is also in charge of scheduling and overseeing the following meetings, uh, which you all know. Um, I oversee all of the commission meetings and as well as the committee meetings. Um, and then ordinances, I codify them through mini code after their approval processes are done. Resolutions are also signed and archived. And then also the audio visual recordings of all the meetings. And last but not least almost is our cemeteries. As you all know, we've had Brooklawn since 2009. Um, I, when I asked shortly after, um, created the Brooklawn Cemetery database in Regis, including adding all the photos of every headstone. And all those headstone photos are then added to Regis. So if you go to our website and you click on Brooklawn, you can click on 
a name and you'll up will pop the headstone for each and every one that we could take a picture of. Mill Creek is our future project. We acquired that in July of 17. Um, as of yet, we haven't gotten you know ready to put all that data into the computer system, but that's a future project. As you can see, since I'm here, I will point out the nice Mill Creek sign. Um, I'd love to do the same with Brooklawn, but we do have a sign ordinance. And so um, hopefully we can do something to um, make Brooklawn sign a little prettier without spending $5,000. <laughs> how did, out of curiosity, how did we do that then? Was that, that does not look like one of our... No, Mil Mill Creeks? Yeah. Mill Creeks was that sign. way when we purchased it. Okay. So we didn't do that. Okay. Yep. But I, you know, it would be nice to say on the bottom of Mill Creeks that it, it's actually a city of Walker um, cemetery now. Mm -hmm. But oh. they, had, they actually had that. But Brooklawn looks a little sad. <laughs> um, let's see. Right now, we might just have to paint the Brooklawn letters or, you know, wait to see what happens because we just had an ordinance committee meeting, so we might see something down the pipe coming up soon. And then being, as, being clerk is more than a 40-hour job, but my passion for this job is worth it. If I'm out of the office at a state, county, or a Bureau of Elections advisory meeting, I'm still available 24-7 via text, phone, and email. Being active and engaged in the IIMC, MAMC, and Bureau of Elections Advisory Committees has been a huge asset to Walker and keeping us on the cutting edge. And our closing statement is, the clerk is the central hub of local government and the most direct link between citizens and the local government, serving as the information and resource center for the community. No other office in municipal service has so many contacts. It serves all administrative and operational departments, as well as the mayor, city commission, and the public. All of them call upon us almost daily for some service or information. The work is not spectacular or exciting, but it demands versatility, alertness, accuracy, and no end to patience. The public does not realize how many loose ends of city administration this office pulls together. And thank you so much for all of your time. Well done. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioners. Any questions? Comments, questions? <clears throat> I have a question about the elections budgets that you guys run. So I guess I had never given it much consideration the way that those are operated. Do we receive special funding that goes into those funds directly from, I imagine, state or federal government? And that's kind of operated independently then of the department? Yep, so I, I do put together three budgets, separate, all separate. Um, the city elections, which if they were odd year, were paid for by the city. If there's an even year and there's a March presidential primary, that is paid for by the state. If there is a school election, like in May, or like in this November, since there's nothing else on the ballot, that is paid for by the schools. But at August and November of 2020 is the sole cost of the city. <coughs> Always. Yep. So a little bit of both. Thank you. Commissioner Glanville? Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned that you had some high school interns that helped with some of the archiving mm -hmm. what, a few years ago, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, is that something you would be interested in um, reconnecting or developing? Like, are, do you have an in to interns or? I usually reach out to Kettawa Hills. Okay. And usually they're um, AP students, mm -hmm. you know, things like, well, they're always getting wanting um, credit hours. Um, uh, Roxanne, do you know on that? Are those is that paid or unpaid internships? It's unpaid. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Right. So that would be like NHS um, yeah. volunteer hours? Um, I just like know that. from Nicole, she came in like three to five, okay. uh, four days a week. Um, and then she did stay on in the summer, and then we paid her for that summer oh, okay. because she, she was like her summer before college. I do remember um, they would allow us to do internships at Kenawa for credit as well. I imagine that's something that's what I'm you, you would be able to use it as one of your school day credits and oftentimes yeah. some would use that as their first hour of the day and just happen to show up an hour late. <laughs> right? Um, I got another question too about the um, absentee voter applications. So I know you've been, I mean, I received one in the mail. I know they've been sent out to a number of residents. Um, are those 
permanent or is that per because you mentioned they're permanent AV if somebody puts in for an absentee ballot is that make it permanent or do they need to indicate that or do they have to sign up every year you have to indicate that probably anybody that was mailed one was on our permanent absentee list um, but typically if anybody does come in and says they want to get an applet an absentee ballot mm -hmm. we ask them if they want to be put on that list and they say yes sure okay so Oh, one more question. Can you um, verify, the, is the election email election at walker.city? It's election at walker.city, okay. correct. Thanks. Election? Election. Elections with an S. Yeah. Thank you. It's yep. in here too, Karen. I just oh, that. and while I'm up here, I'll tell you that too. So I passed around, um, this was part of the Community Engagement Committee, and rather than mailing out our normal yearly newsletter that was created in January, for the new residents, we just are doing some today. How many ladies was it? 300? No. Close to. Yeah, it's about 300. So that's for a month and a half of new people that moved into Walker. And rather than mailing out a newsletter to them that was made in January, Kendra created this one in front of you. And it's a generic, and it's everything you'd want to know or hopefully would like to know when you move into the city of Walker. And then with it is a piece we took the letter for each ward so ward one are getting the one letter with those two commissioners ward two new residents are getting the ward two ward three are getting the ward three letter so we folded that inside and then we're putting the label on it and mailing those and they'll probably go out tomorrow yeah so tomorrow. this is the that is the one for new residents and it's already been ordered and everything oh yeah so mm -hmm. if there were an error that's yeah that would be the next time kendra orders more okay yep I have a question about the data scrub. Does yes. that show up? Um, does that reveal deceased um, voters? Uh, no. Uh -uh. Can you read the question? Does does the NCOA do reveal deceased? No. No. Mm -mm. No, it does not. Yeah, uh, I remember. We get those from the county as well as other. Sorry. That's okay. In regards to deceased, we get those from the state as well as the county. Um, the county sends us their list of deceased, and then the state will send out theirs as well. Um, I know Mindy over at the city of Grand Rapids uh, usually gets a larger list and when one of our voters is kind of in theirs they send us that notification as well and that's a good question Melanie another thing um, the state's working on is it's called epic we have a lot of acronyms in our in our um, department but what it is is to for the state to tie in with all the other states um, we do have a pretty good um, catch on anything in within Michigan but it's very hard if somebody was to pass away in Florida and without a family member telling us we don't have get that information so then it's we get that information sometimes when we mail the application for an FST ballot and then a family member brings it in to say that they have passed or and when we send them <laughs> Or when we send the NCOA, a family member will let us know if that voter has passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that the state was doing something on this and trying to work on it. So that's helpful to get yep. that clarification on what that is. Yep, and it's really needed. So I'm really anxious for them to move that forward. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, commissioners? Can you um, tell me again uh, the email? You have an interaction email with the public now? Mm -hmm. oh, elections. Cool. Can you explain a little bit about that? Elections at walker.city. Okay. So we created that when we mailed out those um, applications or letters to say, do you want to be on the permanent AV list? And they can mail the postcard back, but we also put on there, or you can just email us at this address and just say name and address, and we'll put you on the list. And we also have that in our newsletter, that even the e-newsletter that goes out from Kendra. And I noticed that every month that she sends the e-newsletter in our elections at Walker.City, we will get about five with that first week. So people are reading it in the e-newsletter. -newsle and it's on our website. And it's on our city website. That's a, yep. I thought that was a great idea. And yeah. then also I, I like the fact that you're collaborating with different departments like uh, the assessing. Yep. We always have, but um, it's been great improvements in the recent years. Perfect. But now we're kind of getting that data electronically, so it's easier to see it. Can you share it back yes. with Great. Thank you. <coughs> Just uh, 
new residents, but also residents. If this is, you know, having this online for the residents. And I agree. That would be a great idea, uh, Dan. I will um, talk I really, to Kendra about that. It's, to me, it's a very good tool to have for yeah. everyone. I know it's, you know, that in the business, the new businesses is something I can remember from years and years ago when Kathy and Daryl, or Frank and I, um, talked about doing them. And both of those packets, I think, are just huge for the city to moving in the right direction. Um, going to businesses with those new packets, they're just so thrilled to receive that packet of information about what Walker has to offer. And it's amazing to hear them say, I didn't know we had a Walker Rights and Fitness Center or, you know. Um, the things that they didn't realize that we have. So I think it's been a really great uh, benefit. And you cover a large area and do well at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. I think I'll just I'll, I'll bring us home. For those of us, um, um, sometimes that refrain when I say those of us have been around for a little while, and uh, I think back, and I'll actually go back to 1999, and um, I remember the cemetery is coming up in record keeping then, and uh, um, we have just come light years ahead. And I would say it's it's um, kind of gone on, on hyper speed the uh, last five to eight years, and uh, we've come a long, long ways. It it not only um, allows us to be more effective from a, a governmental entity, but I think the levels of service that we're able to provide to the community are, are uh, outstanding. And I know we do get recognized not just locally, but uh, regionally, uh, you know, within the state on this. So thank you for all you do. Great presentation. Love the color theme. Extra credit for the color uh, coordination <laughs> tonight for all three of you. So well done. Thank you. It's, uh, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is great to see. So thank you. Thank thanks you all three of you. One thing, do you guys mind sending that PowerPoint as well yeah. to us so that we can... We just didn't want you to see it ahead of time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. All right. Um, so we hit the discussion items. Um, I'm assuming everybody's had a chance to review the staff reports. Any questions on those before we move on? All right. Um, I do notice I'll uh, use discretion here and uh, move a, a version of public comment up because I see some people in the audience. Are there uh, um, some comments that uh, uh, open public comment agenda items or non-agenda items? Anybody that you want to ask questions of? Dr. Taylor, nothing? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I will jump to commissioner's comments. Um, uh, actually, I'll start, uh, as our clerk's getting set, I'll come back to her then. Uh, Commissioner Gilbert? Yeah, um, we had a very productive ordinance committee meeting today. I think we were managed to actually get some of those items we've been working on for quite a while off of the table. We didn't make it around to the tree ordinance because we wanted to go uh, check out our new fire truck. Um, but the things that we did get to, we had a discussion on um, our sign standards, as our uh, clerk mentioned. Um, that may be something that comes to us. Some new materials were um, not recommended, but kind of suggested that we could implement in terms of uh, facing for the signs that may be more cost effective. Um, so that's something that we'll certainly consider. Um, we did also um, have a discussion on residential um, housing for the elderly and allowing that in our low density zoning by special exception use. Um, so that's something that, again, we'll come back to the Ordinance Committee again, but I think that we are uh, turning in a direction that we're trying to make that work um, to make more accessibility for those types of housing developments where appropriate. <clears throat> um, mobile food vendors, we finally got that uh, food truck ordinance moved forward, and that'll be coming to Planning Commission and then to the City Commission. Um, restructuring of our temporary use regulations, which came as a result of former Commissioner Sandy Howland um, and her work, so that is coming around as well. Um, sign change frequency, I think we landed on 15 seconds for uh, frequency changes, so that'll be coming around to Planning Commission and then hopefully back here instead of circling again to Ordinance Committee. Um, and residential fencing requirements, I mean, we did make some small adjustments to our residential fencing regulations as well. Again, that'll go to the Planning Commission and then hopefully to the City Commission. Good stuff, thank you. Commissioner Glanville? Um, yeah, so um, last week I attended the um, Algro Education Outreach Committee meeting. I got hooked up with them um, last spring 
when I was at the Spring Forum. I know Rachel and Scott, our engineering department, are pretty active there, and so they got me uh, wrapped into that. And I think um, that's going to present some opportunities for us to maybe ramp up a little bit with what we do in outreach um, with, with the city, with citizens and residents. Um, in particular, this week is Septic Awareness Week. Um, and they've been tracking some data, um, municipal data, through that education committee. And so in Walker last year, there were 19 repair permits that were applied for, which um, ended up, say, I don't want to say saving, but um, through those efforts, 3 million plus gallons of water that come through our septic, through Walker, was cleaned, cleansed, like made safe for the environment. <laughs> What's the, so there were 19 septic systems that were not in good repair that were then, you know, sending contaminated water into the groundwater and things like that. Um, and so through those permits, they were able to clean up. Um, the effect was on over 3 million gallons of water here in the city. So I think there's some low-hanging fruit maybe if we just help people be aware of what to look for, um, particularly in that area, that would be a, a good place to just do some outreach. Um, there's an adopt-a-drain program I think a lot of people are unaware of, that you can adopt a storm drain if it's in your residential area, wherever you want. You can go onto a map and put your name on it and then just make sure that that's cleared out so that we don't get localized flooding and things like that. Um, so just looking at um, how we might be able to do a little bit more around that. And maybe that's something with the community, I don't know what the, if the community outreach committee might be involved in some of those efforts, I don't know what their agenda necessarily is. So, but just some thoughts there. Um, I was also out um, inviting people to the planning meeting and, and met some really nice neighbors who shared their umbrellas with me during the storms we had last week. So I appreciated that. And of course, the river cleanup um, was great. I was able to join a work crew with the team from Walker Roadhouse, and it was just really nice. Um, to, to see that Dennis is doing such a, you know, really doing some community outreach. I talked to them about other, if they wanted to be involved in other types of regular community things, and they were pretty excited about that. It looks like they're going to be doing more in that area, so hopefully we can pull in Walker Roadhouse a little bit more to some of the things we're doing. Um, and I think that's it in the last week or so, so thanks. Good, thank you. Commissioner Groves. Uh, prior to the ordinance committee meeting, we had a personnel committee meeting, and most of or several of us were there, but um, approved the IT manager position to be um, recruited, which um, a lot of thanks to the staff, and I guess especially thanks to Julie for doing the two jobs for as long as she has, basically. Um, approved the uh, incentive for the DPW workers um, to obtain and maintain their uh, playground inspector training and the commercial pesticide applicator training. Um, so they'll have two, uh, two workers for each of those um, licenses, which um, they will then just have a little extra compensation when they maintain those licenses. And um, I think that's, that's some good incentive to keep them, keep them active and doing that. Nice. That'd be it. That's about it. Good stuff. All right. Clerk, before I go this way, I'll come back your way. Anything no, else? No, I think I've said enough for tonight. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. Thank you. Let's rise and go. Uh, Saturday, I attended the Grand River Mary cleanup. We worked on the south side of Walker, by the Millennium Park area, and picked up a lot of trash in just like a small little area, which is crazy that how much flows down there every year, mm -hmm. for even every year that I've done it that it just still accumulates in so much. Good, thank you. Commissioner Bishane? Yep, I'm good. All right. Commissioner Kemp? I think you got it covered. <laughs> All right, good. Our managers, Mr. Walsh. Master plan open house for the northwest part of town, Wednesday from 5 to 7 in this room. That's it. Thank you. Carol? I am good. I'll be gone next week's meeting. Frank will be here to handle it. But other than that, things are going good. All right. Um, short, sweet on mine. Um, if you've not had a chance to uh, take a walk out there yet, there was a, uh, a great Eagle Scout project um, almost completed over the weekend out in uh, City Central Park here towards the Police and Fire Memorial. 
And what it is is it's meant to be there is a, a, a process of um, the ceremonial process that you follow when, when um, disposing of um, the American flag. So um, it's meant to be a fire pit for that. There is a custom cover uh, that's being done right now. DeWise Manufacturing agreed to do it um, at no charge. Um, so they're putting a cover so it can be locked down so people can't walk up and uh, just have fires in there, so to speak. It'll be used for, uh, um, um, for those types of events. Um, the uh, only other thing I'd have is the Census Complete Count Committee um, spent part of the day at that um, short uh, part of the afternoon. Um, and for those that don't are not aware of it, um, we, um, speaking with the managers and, and myself, have uh, decided to get, because uh, it aligns with the social media and our communications piece, uh, Kendra's um, taken a, a lead role with that. Uh, the mayors have agreed uh, to stay involved with it from a visibility purpose. Um, but this, this is coming up, and as we get closer to the first of the year, um, it's going to be pretty significant in the involvement with it. So we're going to, uh, um, she spent a couple of hours through a, a training workshop today down there, and then um, um, joined me at a, a meeting um, right after that. So I'm excited about that, more to come there. Um, that's all I have, so anything else for the good of order? All right, I won't ramble. Uh, do we have a, we need a motion to adjourn. We are done, folks.